to Ready or Not, Butt Side Up's first ever stand up comedy night. I'm far too pale for this much light. It's not fair. Uh, yeah, so really thank you so much to all of you for coming down and supporting this. This is a really exciting night for us, like I said, it's our first ever stand up comedy night. And uh, we're also raising uh, money tonight for LAS which is the Lesbian Asylum Support of Sheffield. So uh, half the money from tonight and all the money from the raffle will be going towards that amazing charity in Sheffield. So please give generously. <laughs> Speaking of, we have an amazing raffle. If you've not already bought tickets, you should, because there are some prizes that I'm being told that I have to tell you. So uh, there's various tickets to local theatre companies, including us, for our production of uh, The Importance of Being Honest. There's Rent by HSU Theatre. We've got various tickets for uh, Tabby Tees, Hagler's Corner and Rude Shipyard, including some club night tickets for Levenhill, a stationer's bundle, which is not stolen from my old workplace at all. Um, <laughs> some vouchers uh, for Timson's in a workshop, uh, a nice bottle of vodka donated by our lovely friends at Dempsey's, and also a five pound bar tap for here tonight as well. So, uh, during the first interval, we're going to have two intervals tonight. During the first one, please uh, buy your raffle tickets and have lots of fun as well, laughing along. Um, thank you to The Hulk for hosting us. We were here only a few weeks ago for Five Lesbians Eating a Quiche. Yes, that's a play if you didn't see it. <laughs> and we had such a fantastic time, we thought we'd come back. In the unlikely event of a fire, like my face lighting up, here, uh, fire exits just through the door that you came through there. Just follow a bar side up uh, member and you will be fine. Um, yeah, it, it's really exciting for us uh, as bar side up to be branching out into kind of stand up comedy. We've kind of accidentally become an LGBT theatre company. It's not how we aim to set out, but with most of the founders of the committee being LGBT, and then we did Batman the Musical, where Batman and Robin ended up together. Uh, we did uh, Lesbian Macbeth. So Macbeth and Lady Macbeth, both women in the 1980s, that was pretty darn gay. Um, first side production from last year, that had some pretty gay monologues in it. And then obviously we had five lesbians eating a quiche, so, and then we're continuing that theme further with our next production, The Importance of Being Earnest. Granted there's not gay specifically in that, but it's written by Oscar Wilde, so it really can it get any gay. <laughs> then Oscar Wilde. Um, so, we've kind of accidentally become that, but I'm not mad about it, because who doesn't need more LGBT representation uh, on the stage, behind the stage, and just in everyday life in general, really. Uh, speaking of, uh, I'm going to get off the set. <laughs> uh, I'm going to get off and I'm going to introduce our first act of the evening. Uh, this is one of five very funny ladies who absolutely smashed it in Five Lesbians Eating a Quiche, uh, for those of you who can see it. Everything in the show is the hilariously dry Charlotte Meredith. stand-up comedy which is terrifying yeah. not for me for you I mean whoever it is it's my first time and things yeah this is it's gonna go well <laughs> absolutely love stand-up it's kind of like writing a book we're all kind of at it right now <laughs> well <laughs> I was worried did that one no one would get that anyway <laughs> my boyfriend is in the I can see him my boyfriend is in the audience today I love him very dearly because having him means I don't have to date anymore. <laughs> it may surprise you to know that I found dating difficult. I do possess a face and body that one might call brave. <laughs> I used to really hate that term, but if you've ever gone braless in the winter with tits that go, <laughs> it takes on a whole new meaning. <laughs> um, yeah, I never really had any luck with women in particular. Um, I don't know if this is just my experience, but every queer woman in the UK is five foot four or shorter. Now, I know there's someone here that's going, I'm five foot six, and it's like, that's still short. <laughs> Where were you when I was single? <laughs> it's more of a thing about my body image, really. It's uh, nothing to do with them. It's because I couldn't really imagine walking down the street with my cute little girlfriend looking like Lenny, a la Mice and Men, just. <laughs> I know, right? You can see it. 
<laughs> men weren't any better, men were brutal. I was over at the uh, Lentmore smoking area with a couple of friends a few years ago and a man approaches us with an Italian accent because you know that seemed fine at the time when you're drunk. So <laughs> he comes up to us and says, ah, I study psychology, I, I, I know it's not a good accent. But <laughs> the fact was neither was his. <laughs> I bet you I could analyse all three of you. And of course we say yes, because we love hearing about ourselves. <laughs> so he turns to my first friend and says, Ah, you are a wild fire. You cannot be tamed and you belong to no one. And she loves it. He turns to my second friend and says, Ah, you, you are beautiful, a kind soul. Ah, you enchant men. She loves it. He turns to me and says, Ah, you have a great sense of humour. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. I'm glad I found this one. I found a tall one, that's important for aforementioned reasons. I swear you can look online at a guy's profile and it just says, Gap here in MAGA love, lads on tour, lock her up, six foot three. <laughs> six foot three, you see. <laughs> I once went on a date with a guy who took me to a cafe with lovely low beams and he kept banging his head on them. So arousing. <laughs> The current one was lovely. <laughs> it was very romantic. He offered to walk me home. Aww. Aww. Safety. <laughs> <laughs> we get to the tram stop and a man approaches us and um, obviously smashed, but also very friendly. He's chatting to us, it's fine. Until he turns around and walks and goes, An A led. Give her one for me. Because <laughs> we, we can't trust men. <laughs> now, a lot was riding on his response because this, this was a test and he chooses only if she's okay with it. <laughs> Which means consent was in consideration, so the bar had been passed. <laughs> I lived at the top of the hill at the time, so the date ended at the bottom of the hill. I was not going to be on my first date doubled over. Like, <laughs> that was great. <laughs> Love's great, isn't it? <laughs> Love's full of so many firsts. Do you remember the first time you farted in front of your partner? I do. I was the <laughs> I'm the lady, so I have to go last, but don't worry, he made it easy on me. <laughs> About the third date or so, he's looking at my phone, and at the time I had a diet tracking app, Boring, but <laughs> it was empty for that day. So, of course, he grabs my phone and he starts typing and he starts giggling. <laughs> you can see where this is going. It's dicks, it's dicks, guys. He wrote dicks. <laughs> and he's giggling away like a child who has just discovered his innate sense of humour as a man and he can't help it, it just goes. It happens. <laughs> I can't identify with that. I come from a military background, background and have crippling anxiety. My arsehole is like that. <laughs> Unless consciously changed. <laughs> I didn't get away as lucky. I made it to about eight months. I did not make it to eight months. I'm just very subtle and he's unobservant. It's perfect. <laughs> I've done it already, so I just let it happen. <laughs> now, midway through, because yes, it was that bad, <laughs> I realised that he, we have never done this before. And I swear to God, Ave Maria was playing in the background. <laughs> Not that you would have heard it. <laughs> On the decibel levels, it kind of goes, woo girls at a bar, a man giving an opinion no one asked for. <laughs> This part. <laughs> Love has no dignity and neither do I. Thank you. Not the content I was expecting, but thank you, Sean. That was absolutely fantastic. Uh, we're going to move straight on. Uh, next up is Matt. Uh, he's helping us to fill our quota for straight white men, because uh, of course we have to have one. <laughs> uh, this is actually Matt's first time uh, performing with Butt Side Up, so please uh, give a big hand for Matt. It's my first time doing stand-up, but it's not my first time just 
having a massive go about something in front of a group of people. You know? <laughs> so we just go, and uh, all of us here, we, we, we've all lived with people at some time, we've all had flatmates, and we all, we all get on with them in a varying level, and you may notice from the tone of my voice that I may not be getting on with my flatmates. <laughs> And the reason not is for one particular reason, and that is the bins. <laughs> because the bins are a massive issue. And I mean a massive issue, because no one's taken them out since Christmas at this point. And I made the mistake. It was my fault. This is all my fault. Some would say. Because during the first week of uni, the bin got full. And without saying anything to anyone, I took it out. <laughs> During the second week of uni, the bin again was full. And I took it out. <laughs> now at this point, my flatmates assumed that the bin fairies were in play. And that for no, every time the bin filled up, it would magically disappear. And that's how it went. Because they wouldn't bother. It would overflow. Eggshells would be tipping out. They would it would just explode and I would take it out. This means that everything they haven't shat out in the last six months, I have personally carried down two flights of stairs across the courtyard and thrown into a large container. And I'm not less pleased. And after Christmas I'm done. I'm done and I say, this is it, guys. I talk to them all and I sit them down and I say, I'm done. I'm not taking the bin out no more. This is it. We're going to have to do it together. And they go, what? You don't mean the cleaners did it? <laughs> Fuck you all! <sighs> and then, the war of attrition starts. One of them literally said to me, they do psychology as a course, literally said to me, Matt, it's all right. Do you know why this situation is all right? Because you're weak. And we know that you'll break before we do. <laughs> and nothing has ever resolved my will so much in my entire life. And just like that, the bin has not been emptied. <laughs> so we get to that day we all waited for, where the bin finally filled up. The tension was palpable. It overflowed, guys. The eggshells were over. There was crap everywhere. The recyclables were at the side. They got smart. They were trying to be smart about it. They were like, we'll leave it in compartments for him. He'll get over it. But I didn't. And three weeks later, we're at a breaking point. And then one day I walk into the kitchen. And they've got another fucking bin bag in there. Actually, get to the sofas because the gap between the wall and the com the, the gap with the chop shit up on the you know I had a word for that but I've forgotten it now. So it's the bit where you chop the island, the island. There isn't a gap anymore. There's just a pile of bloody bins. So you can't get to the sofas anymore, which just means they don't hang out there anymore. So I don't have to see them. So there are pluses. What's going to happen? I don't know. That's it. I will say there was a reason, there was a reason for this trigger. And that reason was because over Christmas I went through a, a really bad break. When I say a really bad break, I mean a perfectly normal break. <laughs> just gotta, you've got to treat them as they come, don't you? So, uh, <laughs> so I met this girl in Corp on a Wednesday. And we made out for two hours. About an hour and a half in, I turned to her and I said, what's your name, by the way? That was the level of this relationship. <laughs> We went on two dates, and on the second date, she was like, oh, I think we should have a serious conversation. And I was like, should we? And she was like, yeah, serious conversation. I was like, a serious conversation? And she was like, a serious conversation. <laughs> she wanted to ask me out, but she should just man thing, you know, the, the normal role models. It wasn't about it. So we spent about an hour and a half wandering around town, waiting for me to ask her out. Eventually did it, and we were in a relationship. I've never been so ecstatic in my entire life. <laughs> and I went home and told everyone about it. This was about two days before Christmas. And the next day I see her off on the train, all romantic like. We share a kiss on the platform. And she goes home for Christmas. On Christmas Day we call. And I'm like, well, and it was magical. 
And then on, on New Year's Day we call and she's like, you know what? Let's pretend like we're kissing each other and, and as the midnight strokes. And I'm like, sure, sounds like a good idea. <laughs> Call about half an hour later after midnight. And I'm like, you were great, babe. You were great. I was making out of that Foster's mark. It was you. It was you. <laughs> and she says, oh, you were great as well, but mainly because I was uh, making out with someone else. Oh. Just like that. Do you know what the saddest part of this relationship is? I'd written a poem for her. I'd written a beautiful, beautiful poem. <laughs> I'd like to read that to you now. <laughs> My love for you is like a river flowing constantly through ribbons of seamless loving purpose. And that river is like a fresh rose, crimson with passion and delicate as fingers set for desire. And that rose is like a diamond. Sparkling in the dizzying moonlight with turning majesty of true feeling value. And that diamond is like a cup of tea. <laughs> Soothing to the soul and warming to the body with more compassion than made love can show. My love is like a river, like a rose, like a diamond that is a bit like a cup of tea. Basically, I like my love hot, hard, pink and wet. <laughs> Upstairs. I've been Matthew Scotland, you've been great. react to that, <laughs> so I'm just going to move swiftly on. Um, <laughs> uh, our next act is actually the last act in Act 1, so after uh, this we're going to have a short period where you can go to the bar, go for a cigarette, go to the toilet and things like that. You, buy raffle tickets. You can buy raffle tickets. <laughs> and um, Becky also told me that I have to mention you can also buy a butter, shirt, butter side up t-shirt if you so wish. <laughs> they are £15, they look lovely, they're black, they're slimming, they go with everything. <laughs> but uh, before that wonderful moment where you get to get up uh, from your chair, please welcome the bilingual, bisexual, Beth and Tanner. <laughs> Yeah, I know that everybody else kind of did the subtle thing of going around the back and then coming out the door, but I was sat right there. I was just like, I'm just going to go in <laughs> five seconds, go back out again. <laughs> but yeah, so you probably haven't noticed, but I'm Welsh. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's funny to say to an English crowd, it's always like, oh no. <laughs> That's unfortunate. <laughs> but generally, people's reaction uh, at first is to do their best Welsh impression, which always comes out Indian for some reason. <laughs> and I don't really understand why, but that's how it goes. And then they follow with, oh, but you don't sound Welsh. And I take it very well. In my mind, I stab them 43 times. <laughs> But out on the outside, I say, oh, yeah, well, I'm from Cardiff. There's, there's lots of different accents there. So. And they go, no, 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 I've been to Cardiff. So I was on a Hindu there uh, three years ago. So I know what the Cardiff accent is. And I'm like, wow, you got me. I'm really from Reading. <laughs> but yeah, there is definitely like a, an English Welsh survive. It's sometimes a bit awkward because English people will be like, oh, you don't really hate us though, do you? And I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> Whatever makes you sleep at night. <laughs> but uh, one of the things, like one of the biggest things that was weird when I moved to England is the buses. I literally, I remember, I got on a bus with a girl, and she was from London, and she gave a tenner to the bus driver, and I was like, what is she doing? They're going to kick her off the bus, what is happening? <laughs> and then he gave her change. 
If, if you give a bus driver a tenner in Cardiff, you will never see it again. <laughs> it will be buried with him. That tenner is gone. <laughs> Unless you have the specific £2.40 that you need for the bus, you will not see that again. <laughs> But yeah, but uh, people are a bit more entertained when they meet my parents because they have actual Welsh accents uh, that people like, especially my mum, she's a Valleys girl. Um, so people, people love that, although she does have different voices for different occasions. Um, so on the phone, she'll, she'll just answer, she always answers the phone, hello, Caroline Tanner, <laughs> followed by, if she realises it's somebody from where she's from, it just goes, oh, hiya, how are you doing? <laughs> no, no, I never. <laughs> so people, people always love a bit of that. But uh, yeah, no, my parents actually, they have a really sweet uh, how they met story. Uh, it's really, yeah, it's very romantic, so I'll, I'll tell you a bit about it. So my, my dad had a very important question to ask my mum. And one day, he plucked up his courage and he went, Caroline Tanner, will you be my divorce lawyer? <laughs> <laughs> and five months later, they were engaged. <laughs> because they're insane, apparently. <laughs> it obviously worked out well, because they're, they're still together. Um, and I'm pretty sure that they always will be, if for no other reason than they hate everyone else. <laughs> And like, it would really be completely just useless to break up because what would you do? <laughs> My mum has no hobbies. <laughs> she, she, she just likes property shows. <laughs> and doing the family accounts. <laughs> she just really likes doing taxes. It's quite sad. <laughs> but yeah, and uh, well, every time I see my parents, they ask the inevitable question, how is your love life? And I'm like, nothing, no, we're not going to discuss this, ever, <laughs> ever, ever, ever. And they're like, oh. my dad was like, all the men in Sheffield and you not found one? And I was like, excuse me, all the men, women and non-binary folks, thank you very much. There are many people who don't want to be with me, father. <laughs> so, you know what, joke's on you, really. <laughs> But yeah, but um, coming out is a bit weird when you're bi because it never ends. <laughs> it just never ends. Every new person you meet, it's just like, there you go, and they're like, oh. <laughs> or they're like, yeah. <laughs> and both are terrible reactions. So that's a point for everyone who's ever wondered how to react. Both bad. <laughs> but I remember um, how I kind of came out to my parents is basically, I waited until my sister came out and then just kind of piggybacked on it. <laughs> so she got to go through all the like big stuff and then I kind of just was a little add-on, like, by the way, <laughs> I think the exact things that I said, I, I went in uh, into their little study. I'm coming across so middle class, but it's, <laughs> it's okay, cause it's true, it's fine. But uh, they're in their study. You know she likes a bit of both. <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, I guess. I was like, same. <laughs> and they were like, okay. And they just continued doing their taxes. <laughs> and we have not discussed it since. That was two years ago. And I'm fine with that. I did my time. I did the thing that's all I need to do as far as I'm concerned. But I was also quite scared about coming out to my sister Lori as well. Because I was like, I know it's like your thing. So I don't, I'm not going to try and steal your thing. I'm not like, yeah, I know, I know it's like, you know, you've got the whole, like, very like, you know, you've got the rainbow flags and you've got literally the rainbow flags everywhere. You've got the hair, you've got, you know, you're doing it. You've got so many plaid shirts. I get it. This is your thing. But is it alright if I kind of tag along? <laughs> Am I tall enough to ride? <laughs>
and it turns out I'm one. <laughs> and she was just like, that's so strange. I don't own bisexuality. <laughs> and I was like, oh, great to know. That is good. But yeah. Um, I, think, I think queer dating is quite strange, really. I'm not good at it. Surprising, I know. Um, men are quite... Men are better because they're very easy to trick. <laughs> Whereas women are a lot more on the ball. <laughs> I swear to God, when you date with a woman, she looks into your eyes and she stares into your soul and she knows everything about you, including your national insurance number, what tax bandwidth you're in, and what your favourite kind of jam is. <laughs> Bramble, by the way. <laughs> And yeah, so women are scary. Um, so, but also, men are terrible. It's a constant battle, really. Also, the thing is with women, is that a woman's nice to you and you're like, and then they're like, here's my boyfriend. And I'm like, oh, cool, you're just a nice person. God, can't you be a dick for once? Come on, Jesus. But yeah, no, I mean, I always find it funny on nights out when I speak to men, or they speak to me, and they are so shocked that I don't want to have a conversation with them. They're like, excuse me, have you seen me? I've been, I've been called difficult so many times, and I'm like, yes, it's because I don't want to be having this conversation. <laughs> and I, it literally, like last night, I came across one such creature. Um, and he was like, he was like, so, uh, what do you do? And I was like, oh, well, I do sales at a solicitor's. And he was like, no, what do you do? What's your passion? And I was like, speaking to anybody but you. <laughs> I was like, I'm a musician. And I was just like, oh, that tells me all I need to know. <laughs> Bye. And, uh, yeah, there was also another guy as well who... He came over to me and my friends, and he says, look, I don't want you to think that I'm just one of those guys who just comes over to a group of women and starts speaking to them, even though he doesn't know who they are or know anything about them, but he's just trying to get in there and trying to have a chat. And I was like, oh, yeah, no, fair enough, that's cool. What part are you not doing? <laughs> he was like, what do you mean? I was just like, I mean, you did walk over here. You did start speaking to a group of women you don't know. And, and, and you won't leave us alone. So what part of that is not happening right now? And he was just like, very difficult. <laughs> yeah, I got that a lot tonight. Thank you. It's great. But yeah, I think the thing is, destroying men is my favourite pastime. <laughs> because there's just, oh, they all need bringing down a peg or two, mostly. All the ones that speak to me. <laughs> But, um, yeah, generally, I just, it, it genuinely shocks me how low the bar is for men. Like, women will literally be like, oh my god, my boyfriend had my, held my hand once. <sighs> he bought me a teddy bear for Valentine's Day. So romantic, we're gonna get married. And then it's like, oh, my boyfriend said I look quite nice. <laughs> and I'm like, that, this whole conversation makes me so sad on your behalf. I'm just like, I'm one of those people, I'm like the opposite with women on nights out, because I'm the ultimate hype woman. I'm just like, men are like the trash. And then women are like, you are a goddess. <laughs> I'm just like, I like, literally, I hear across, across the room, oh, my boyfriend did this, and really hurt my feelings when I'm there. <laughs> and I'm just lurking in the shadows, like some kind of weird breakup spirit, like, damn pain. <laughs> oh, but we are in a damn pain. <laughs> and it's just, yeah, it's beautiful. So yeah, generally, I, uh, I keep, keep things to myself. Although that also has unfortunate consequences, such as I found out when I was living at home a uh, couple of years ago, I was busy, if you know what I mean. <laughs> and my mum's like, oh, Bethan, can I just go through some, uh, some clothes with you? We're going through a charity shop. And I was like, yeah, in a minute, mum. 
<laughs> and then I just tied everything in the duvet. I'm like, yeah, come in, cool, I'm cool, I'm cool, this is, this is cool. <laughs> and she comes in and she's like, so look, yeah, I just wanted to go through these shirts. I mean, this one's quite nice. Do you, do you want to? I was like, yeah, I don't know, yeah, yeah. And then I lean over and something starts buzzing. <laughs> And she's like, ooh, what's that? And I was like, it's my phone. It is my phone. My phone is under the duvet and it is ringing. And she was just like, ooh, do you need to answer it? No, 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 it's ringing for an awfully long time. <laughs> yes, yes it is. That's just how phones are nowadays. <laughs> I know that you've still got like a little brick where you literally press the button three times to do a C. <laughs> But uh, no, that's just her. They just they just keep on going <laughs> forever. <laughs> and she was just like, okay, well, there's this shirt, and oh, they, you said this one was quite nice, but you said this one was a bit tight, so I wasn't I wasn't really sure. I was like, no, I hate them all. <laughs> Get rid of them. Oh well, you said last week that you loved this shirt. No, I hate it. I hate it. Take it away. Take it away. Out of the room right now. <laughs> I'm begging you. <laughs> Thank God she did. And also, when she left, I noticed that my phone was just there. <laughs> so either she figured it out, or she now thinks that I am just a drug dealer with two phones. <laughs> I think I prefer that she think the second one. To be honest, if they did think that, though, my dad definitely would have come up in the evening and just been like, so, here you got the goods. <laughs> Do you think you can fix me up? Because he lived through the 60s. You know how it is. <laughs> And yeah, and I think that's pretty much all I've got, to be honest. I was supposed to have longer, but I didn't count, I didn't count how long it was going to be, so... <laughs> that's me done. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, count that, wasn't it? Uh, welcome back. Good to see that everyone has come back. Fantastic. <laughs> Loving that enthusiasm. <laughs> uh, yeah, welcome back to... Uh, this is act two. Um, so I recently moved house. Very stressful. Wouldn't recommend it. One out of five stars. Um, but what did make it incredibly easier, as opposed to when I was a student and I just moved things in shopping trolleys from one to another. <laughs> Great way of transporting. Jamie's a fan, clearly. But this time, uh, because we have a lot of our own furniture now, me and my partner, we decided that we would be, uh, we would pay the money for a moving van. Which, um, when two big burly guys from Stoke turned up, I really wanted to tell them that my drag name is Mini Van Rental. But I didn't really think they'd appreciate it in the same way that a lot of my friends do, so I decided to keep that little tidbit uh, to myself. Um, I had pre-packed some of my own stuff, because I paid extra so that they just pack everything for us, they disassemble furniture, and it was great. I did pack standing home myself, because again, I didn't think two guys from Stoke wanted yeah. to go through our bottom drawer of two gay men who've been together for four years, so uh, that was kind of dealt with ourselves. Um, I was slightly disappointed though, because they said that they'd pack everything, and they brought 15 boxes. The rest of it we'd have to pack ourselves. I was like, yeah, that's fine, that's reasonable, time constraints and such. When I opened the boxes at the other end of the new house, I opened one box and there was pillows in it. I was like, pillows? I could have packed pillows. It's like, the lightest fuck and there's like three in a massive box. I was like, I expected you to pack things. Um, I don't know why I was surprised because when they were packing stuff away in, in my kitchen, I watched them just take out my cutlery drawer and just upturn it into a box. <laughs> clattering away on top of pots and pans that were just put into a box as well. There was zero care given to my my crockery. <laughs> As a gay man, that really hurt my feelings. I then saw him heading towards my glasses cupboard. Now, as a middle-class white gay man, my wine glasses are very important to me. <laughs> Darlington fucking crystal. And I was not letting him go anywhere near, and I vividly remember I leapt across my kitchen and slammed my hands over. I went, no, I'll pack this cup of it. <laughs> you go and pack yourself some more fucking pillows. <laughs> but other than that, they were very, very good. They built, or they took apart a bed that I had zero idea how I put up. I don't think I did put it up. Jamie put it up. Thank you. Fucking right. <laughs> I saw your shot. I have zero idea how to take that down, so I'm very glad for the support of them. It was really weird though because I booked this moving company all on an app. 
There was no human contact at Millennial Street. <laughs> there was no human contact, it was all just booked over an app and all just uh, communicating over text, which was really good. Um, I have a bit of trouble communicating over text though, I think tone can't always come across. I'm a sarcastic fuck. And so tone uh, can be read very badly over text. I'm also really guilty of overly using the crying, laughing face. I use it basically as a full stop, so all my friends must think they're hilarious. <laughs> when in reality I'm just like in my bed with the duvet, just like, okay. <laughs> crying laughing face. Um, and then autocorrect as well. I just can't get on with autocorrect. I mean, I've never meant ducking <laughs> in my entire life. And it's how it just doesn't learn as well. Like, it'll correct it and I'll go, no, but then I'll type it again, it'll correct it again. It's like, no, I've already corrected you once, please don't try again. And it means that things get miscommunicated. I texted my friend the other day saying, do you want to go for a walk by the river? Came out as wank by the river. <laughs> really, I meant to say, do you want to go for a wank by the canal? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, coming up now, uh, we're going to have uh, Ella, who is the author of a fantastic blog and an all round boss bitch, really. Uh, over the last couple of years, she's accidentally been the third wheel on several first dates with my various boyfriends over the last few years. So she's a real trooper. Uh, I want to give you a big, uh, I want you to give her a big hand because she's really fantastic. So please welcome Ella. Gonna do some stage rearranging because I all want you to look at me in the light. Yes, I'm that conceited. So, how are we doing tonight? Are we doing well? Yeah. Got a bit to drink? Yeah? Yeah. yeah? yeah, feeling good? Good, it's gonna be a good night. Right, so this is a fundraiser for lass. Shout out if you're a lesbian. Good, shout out if you're queer. Shout out if you're straight, this world is already built for you. <laughs> <laughs> so, my name's Ella. Uh, I go by Ella Nobra Watts. Uh, it's an anglicised version of my actual name. Uh, my given birth name is Eliana Nobrevaxha. Uh, if anyone wants to spell that, one go, no try, I will buy you a drink. Terms and conditions can apply. I might not want to buy you the drink. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's a weird, like, foreign, foreign name for a foreign person, and I already have so many like weird identity issues because it's just like a mixed race, I have a foreign name, like everything about me is just a bit like meh. So I am like, I'm the token person of colour in my group of friends because I grew up with a lot of whites. <laughs> grew up in Brighton, it's a very nice, very liberal place, very, very white. And yeah, so a lot of my friends just be like, oh no, no, I'm not racist. Friends with Ella. <laughs> I'm like, cool. Yeah, I was once described um, as a friend of mine said, hey Ella, you know, you're like the blackest friend I know. First of all, <laughs> did you see the way I just came in? Like that little dance I just did. I may have black African jeans, but they are not exhibited today. Plus, I'm wearing Harry Potter glasses and a Strokes t shirt. <laughs> Yeah, it speaks for itself, really. <laughs> Any of you watch Queer Eye? Woo! Yeah, there we go. I love Queer Eye. It is the best show. For those of you who aren't familiar, it's about five gay guys who make over someone's life. And one of them's like, I'm gonna do your hair, I'm gonna like trim your beard, it's gonna be all great. Another one's like, I'm gonna teach you how to dress so your wife will leave you. And another one's like, I'm gonna teach you how to make guacamole, it's gonna be amazing. And one of them was like, tell me your deepest, darkest secrets and I will fix them. And then one of them, the trooper. His name is Bobby. Yes, people familiar with Bobby, yes. Bobby is really the gem of the show because he comes in. They have a week to make over these people's lives and he's like, I have built you a new house. I have fitted you this wonderful new kitchen. I tore out all the carpets and all the hardwood flooring and replaced it with marble. And one episode in the recent series, right, there was this lesbian black woman, right? And she had, yeah, you know. And she like just had this like 
terrible life where she was like abandoned by her adopted gay parents and like it was it was a, it was a deal. And what he, what he did, he reunited her with her sister who she thought was her cousin. And he rebuilt this life for her, and it was just like, oh my god. So not only does this guy rebuild your house, but he's also like reconnecting you with all this family, and it's just like, Anthony just makes guacamole, and everyone's like, oh my god, Anthony, we love Anthony, oh my god, he's so hot. And it's like, really? <laughs> but maybe just because Bobby's a Virgo, and I identify with that a lot because I have a Virgo moon. Yes, I'm one of those astrology bitches. <laughs> Don't judge me. I see all the dead faces in the crowd tonight. Yes, I'm going to talk about it and you're going to enjoy it, okay? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I told you, you're going to enjoy it. <laughs> My ex thought I was very really dumb for believing in astrology. Um, and I said to him, you're Catholic. <laughs> You're Catholic, because you believe in a guy in the sky who drowned everyone in the world except for one hipster bearded dude at his boat zoo. <laughs> you also banish Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden for getting their five a day. <laughs> Yet, premarital sex is absolutely fine. <laughs> By the way, just in case anyone was wondering. Yeah, apparently God is super, super cool with BJs and anal if you don't put a ring on it. Like, no, it's all okay. <laughs> But you know, astrology is a fake science, like... <laughs> yeah. No, so I'm a Leo, in case anyone was wondering. You know, I, I moved so the light was on me, in case you couldn't tell that I'm a Leo. But yeah, but with my Virgo moon, two very opposing forces. If anyone knows anything about astrology, Leo and Virgo just don't get on, and they live within me. So it's a constant struggle of like, Hey, look at me, I'm doing stand-up, this is great, life is great. What do you think you're doing, you dumb bitch? <laughs> no one here's laughing. You think you're funny? And I'm like, yeah, this is great, I'm a Leo, I'm a Leo, my Leo sun is shining, and my Virgo moon's like, we should live in a bin. <laughs> <laughs> it really is a fun, fun seesaw of life to live on. I, I once, I once managed to identify someone's sun sign just by looking at them. I was in a club and I was like doing my thing, my white girl thing, my half white girl thing. <laughs> and this guy was chatting me up and we're chatting and I was like, you a Scorpio? And he was like, yeah. I was like, yeah, I thought so. And he was like, why did you think so? Because you look like you're about to ruin my life. <laughs> And so I dated him for three months. <laughs> and he did ruin my life. <laughs> yeah, uh, he was like, we had, no, to be fair, we had a lot of fun. He was, he was a little bit older. By a little bit, I mean a lot older. Like, late 30s, good job, good car. He had kids from a previous marriage. He's in midlife crisis because he's dating a 25 year old. And it's like, it was all good. It was all good in the hood. And you know, I like to make people feel uncomfortable. So you know how I was talking about like, I'm the token person of color in my friend group. <laughs> well, once I was hanging out with some friends and one of them works like in a hotel bar and he gets given these things called privilege cards. I will note that this friend is a white male. Uh, I thought privilege was given, but so I won't comment. <laughs> so yeah, privilege cards. It entitles you to a free drink at the bar for however many cards you have. And I was like, there's a joke here somewhere. <laughs> so I look at these cards and I'm like, Hmm, is this to make up for the distinct lack of privilege I face as, you know, a woman of colour, you know, bisexual, sorry, greedy bisexual, <laughs> uh, working class, foreign, and he was like, just take my privilege, and his like already white face just went translucent, and it was great, it was great. So with this older guy I was dating, I liked to take advantage of making him uncomfortable. For example, uh, we had a like, nice day out once, and you know, we went for lunch, and we went to the cinema, and it was all great and lovely. And we go to part ways, and we're in this very busy foyer of the cinema, and we go to kiss goodbye. And I really hammered up, like, full PDA, leg over him, you know, just tongues everywhere. It was like, <laughs> just making a scene. And then just before we part, he turns around, and I say, Thanks for the pocket money, see you next weekend! 
and run the other way. <laughs> Just before I turn the corner, I go to look at him, his face is beetroot red, which is the only perk of dating a ginger man, because you can see all the emotions on their face. <laughs> I'm a nice person. <laughs> So yeah, so I'm 25, and my favourite response to that is, fuck you. Because <laughs> I hang out with like a lot of older people, and apparently my youth is intimidating to them. But it's fine, I'm not really that good at being young. Um, I'm really bad with slang. I'm so behind on slang. Earlier today, I told my friend, yes, that song did not slap as hard as the other version. <laughs> I was talking about Shania Twain's That Don't Impress Me Much. <laughs> if you were wondering, the version that doesn't slap as hard as the country one. The dance mix is where you need to live. <laughs> but yeah, but I remember when the term bay became very popular. And I didn't really understand what it meant, but I wanted to be cool because I was supposed to be like a young, hip millennial. So I was talking to a co-worker once who was like slightly younger than me, so I was like, I'm going to impress her with this slang all the kids are using. And I told her, I could really go for like a bay sandwich right now. <laughs> Turns out, after a very awkward meeting with HR, bay was not what I thought it meant. <laughs> they thought I was pre prepositioning her for a threesome with her partner. <laughs> Turns out bay does not mean bacon. <laughs> so yeah, that incident enough was, you know, enough to turn me vegan. <laughs> Yep, yep, I said it, vegan, but you remember, I need to have all the minority points, you know, I'm a woman, woman of colour, you know, bisexual, working class, foreign, I need to have them all, or they don't let you into the Academy of Magna Pixie Dream Girls. <laughs> and if I don't get my chance to sing in an elevator with Joseph Gordon-Levitt to the Smiths playing in the background, then life just isn't worth living. It just isn't. Come on. I already have one strike against my name for not having a fringe, so you know, I need all the chances I can get. <laughs> uh, I left a job recently, and I had the amazing task of writing up a process for my job. So like a training manual with every single thing my job entails, and I'm just like, oh, Virgo Moon's coming out to play today, organization, I'm ready. So I did it, I did it step by step how to do my job, I put in diagrams, I put in bar charts, I put in every single thing, I printed it out, full colour, 50 pages, in my hand. And you know what the best part is? We spiral bound it. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, it was like the best moment of my life, better than any orgasm I've ever had. It, <laughs> it was really amazing. I, I honestly feel like I'm going through a second puberty right now because I'm either always angry or always horny. <laughs> and except for being angry at my mum for not letting me wear like a belly top when I was like eight years old, I'm angry at like society. <laughs> just general society, you know. <laughs> but at the same time, I'm just like, I just want a dick in my mouth right now! <laughs> it's a very complicated place to live. <laughs> but speaking of belly tops, because that's a good segue. <laughs> the one time my mum did let me wear a belly A belly top, by the way, for all the 12 year olds in the audience, is a crop top. <laughs> it's what we call them in the early morts. <laughs> so yeah, the only time my mum did let prepubescent me wear a belly top, for some reason, was during my school talent show, where my friend roped me in to performing the top 10 single by Romanian sweethearts, the Cheeky Girls. <laughs> You know the song, the cheeky song, parentheses, touch my bum? Because <laughs> that's appropriate for nine-year-olds to do on stage. But yeah, I have like vivid flashbacks of like that pink crop top and a cowboy hat. I don't know why we wear cowboy hats. And then just like, and we didn't even sing the song. We just had all three minutes and 22 seconds of the song playing in the background while we just did this. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was a ride. It was, <laughs> it was a time. And the worst part is, we did the dress rehearsal for that. And one of the mums, and I, I mean, I assume it was one of the mums, I hope it was one of the mums and not just a random woman off the street. So 
like, oh girls, that was so good. Did you, do you want me to teach you how to put like a little swing in your hips? And I said, I'm nine. <laughs> Imagine if a man said that to a child. <laughs> That is not appropriate at all. Are you just going to tell the girls who are doing all that jazz from Chicago that, oh, your lingerie is not lingerie enough, <laughs> nine-year-old girls? <laughs> I know Brighton's very liberal, but every time I think about that talent show, I'm just like, what were they thinking? <laughs> Fucking hell. <laughs> uh. <laughs> I was just hydrating, but sure. <laughs> It's nice doing stand-up for a crowd that isn't in London. I live in London, so I do like the open mic circuit a little bit. And it's just an audience full of comedians waiting for their turn. So it's nice just to have people that enjoy being here. But yeah, I'm just gonna leave you on this little note. Uh, I graduated from therapy earlier this year. Woo! I was meant to be ill, now I'm not. You don't get a certificate or anything, it's just a fun way to say, I'm not going anymore. And my therapist was like, so what are you going to do now that you're not like going to the sessions? I'm like, well, instead of paying you to just sit there and nod and ask me how things make me feel, when you know how things make me feel, I made a very detailed list, Virgo Moon, of how things make me feel and all the alternate realities around that. I'm just going to ask my friends for advice for free. <laughs> or, Alternatively, I'm going to stand in front of a mic and do stand-up and tell strangers intimate details of my life. <laughs> and the best part is, you paid to be here and you have to listen. <laughs> Thank you, good night. Everybody. Yes, I'll take that question. No, really, really welcome. That was fantastic. Um, we're going to move straight along with uh, Butter Side Up's original stand-up star. So Lucy did her first stand-up for Butter Side Up's The Bakery. If you've not seen it, don't turn But we will be doing more this year. Um, she is the queen of multitasking. She's the treasurer for Butter Side Up. She's the digital media officer for Butter Side Up. She does pretty much everything over the last couple of months, so she's really been a boss in here. I'm hoping she's enjoying all this praise. It's like the most praise I've given her in many, many years. And I'm like, get the fuck away from you. <laughs> but I do love her very much, so please give it up for Lucy Smith Jr. Hello, but you also moved my stool, which I need for my beer. <laughs> and also, Ella, you put the microphone stand over my notes. <laughs> I did not memorise this. <laughs> so, hi. Um, has everyone asked how you're all doing? You know, in stand-up, they always go, how are we doing tonight? How are we doing tonight? But no, Marianne, how are you doing? <laughs> like, I want to know. I really, I really need to know how you're doing. But not too much because I'm, I'm very emotionally out of it. Um, so just done. Um, so yeah, thank you for coming. Uh, thank you for putting us up, for putting us on. But as Michael said, it was me. So you're welcome, Lucy. Um, also, my dad's here tonight. Woo! really nice that he's here to support me. He's a very nice dad. Also, I'm sorry, because this is getting a real uncomfortable for the both of us, because I'm definitely going to say cunnilingus at some point. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually just occurred to me that I'm now going to have to say it again. Because <laughs> I haven't told that joke yet. <laughs> we can all figure out whether it's going to be worth it or not. Ooh, it's worth it um, so, like Ella and everyone else, I'm in my mid-twenties. Um, it's not really that much different from being in your early twenties, except for the fact that when you hang out with 19-year-olds, you have no idea what half the time they're saying. <laughs> they're going to say is, Girl! You're a nun! What does that mean? <laughs> being in your mid-twenties, however, does mean that you know things like which four pound wine 
to buy. <laughs> Sambuca is never worth it. <laughs> and you also start getting wrinkles, like I have just one wrinkle right, right here from frowning at men. <laughs> or the bartenders in West Street Live are not serving me my Sambuca quick enough because I don't learn. <laughs> All your other friends who are in the mid twenties are doing so much better than you. So I have friends who are getting married, or buying houses, or getting promoted. I have no friend who's having a baby, <gasps> which I'm excited to Not never me. ever hold because <laughs> they are they are sticky, and if they're not sticky, they're somehow crusty. Then they've always got yogurt here. They haven't had yogurt in three days, but it's no. I'm looking forward to looking at and appreciating that baby. And keeping it far, far away from me. I'm a good friend. <laughs> so at Christmas, I was um, back home, and I was having lunch with my friend Mel, who's a great gal, she's been one of my friends since I was 10. And she was telling me about her life, her fiance just bought a house, and she was telling about her week. She was like, oh yes, we just put the deposit down on the florists for the wedding, it's going well. What have you been up to? Um, so, <laughs> last week, I jumped got into a random man's car. <laughs> and before you start worrying, I'm clearly fine. <laughs> I'm fine now. <laughs> but, yeah, for some reason, on my friend's birthday that night in December, I just got real sick of being there and I was like, that bounces a dickhead, oh, I want to go home. And in my head, the magical uber genie just went, <laughs> You're right. Let me take you home for free. Yay! No. What really happened was, I went up to a random car and went, You an uber? No. <laughs> Are you a murderer? No. I'll do! <laughs> You might be feeling a bit concerned. Imagine being me sobering up in the backseat of that car. I'm just sat there like, oh, my big chips on again. <gasps> oh, I'm going to die. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, yeah, this is how I die. Yeah. Oh, no. Oh, yeah, that's the parkway coming up. Yeah, that's the parkway. I'm going to get murdered in Rotherham. <laughs> over the situation because I then rang my friend and be like, I think I just got abducted. <laughs> Turn the location on on your phone. How do I do that? Just fucking do it. <laughs> I spent the entire walk home on the phone to my friend be like, how accurate is that location thing? Like, can you tell if I'm, look, I'm doing this. Can you tell if I'm doing Can you tell? Can you tell if I'm doing this? Go fucking home and I'll kill you myself. <laughs> I'm doing well. <laughs> So, as you might um, notice, I may need to get my shit together. <laughs> Just a bit. Um, unfortunately, um, I don't really have any job opportunities which don't encourage me to drink on a Tuesday afternoon. Because <laughs> I have a degree in film. Yeah, so basically having a degree in film means that I spent £12,000 to spend four years thinking that Quentin Tarantino was a bit overrated and then getting a piece of paper to tell me that I was right <laughs> I had to listen to film bros talk about how Drive was a pinnacle of cinematic excellence so great that they let Ryan Gosling bum them. Hey, <laughs> cool. Good for you, George. But yeah, so... <laughs> Basically, um... I'm fucked career-wise. Trying to get a job with a film degree is like trying to skin a cat with a slightly smaller cat. It is 
very distressing, and very inefficient. <laughs> Yeah, and since I can't put cunnilingus on my TV, I'm basically fucked. Yay! Was that joke worth it? Well, so many yeah. women buy me drinks at the bar. <laughs> so, it made me think, what are the career options for functioning, emotionally unstable alcoholics? Well... <laughs> obviously, firstly, there's blues singers. However, um, my diction's too good. And... I <laughs> And I don't have a methadone addiction quite yet. <laughs> also, as you can tell from how painfully southern I am, I just don't have enough of that whatever attitude it is. If you imagine me singing a Rolling Stones song, yeah, you got satin shoes. <laughs> so, I'll go. <laughs> so that's not really one of them. Also, I can't play guitar because my hands are tiny. Um, second option, I guess, is doing stand-up, which is basically me just doing this, and it seems to be going okay so far. Thank you. Because, um, you know, I think stand-up as a medium is very interesting. It allows us to sort of examine ourselves through a different lens. By using humour, we can truly understand ourselves and ask really, really important questions like... What is the deal with airline food, guys? <laughs> so yeah, in the meantime, I'm just going to keep being a bit of an alcoholic mess. Um, for instance, I invented a drink, which is where you take Echo Falls. It's not wine, guys. Stop calling it wine. It is a yellow beverage, Becky. It is a yellow drink. It doesn't say wine anywhere on the bottle. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 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 no, so you take this already gross drink and then you top it up with vodka. <laughs> Me and my friends like to call this drink, yes, yeah, so you can develop daddy issues in your mid twenties. <laughs> <laughs> it turns out if you drink enough of these, you then end up leaving the nightclub crying deleting all of your social media apps going, I'm such a terrible person. Yeah. I shouldn't talk to anyone. I'm going to leave Messenger and Facebook and Twitter and Instagram because, you know, I don't deserve to look at avocado or toast either. <laughs> so anyways, how are you doing, Dad? <laughs> Respect for me. Um, so I'll tell a nice story now. <laughs> kind of. So I don't know if you can tell by the everything about me, but I'm a big old massive lesbian. <laughs> we needed one, didn't we? Um, fun fact: I didn't realise I was gay until about the age of 1920. I just thought I liked Shakira for her music. <laughs> Me and my dad would listen to Shakira at car music and we'd be like, oh, she, like, I do feel like her third album has much more lyrical integrity. Oh, yes, no, I agree. <laughs> we like hips don't lie for the pure lyrical content of Wycliffe John's fucking rap verse. Where he says, yeah, refugees are the seas because we own our own boats. <laughs> what the fuck does that even mean? <laughs> no, it's because Shakira is blonde Colombian and her hips literally do not lie. <laughs> I remember going to a Joan Jett concert when she was singing the song, Do You Want to Touch Me There? And then be like, oh, yeah, I do. <laughs> and so, you know, kind of upon realising that I was not one of the straights, I kind of thought, do I come out? There, it's not really relevant, I'm painfully alone. I don't need to introduce anyone to my parents, they'll get there on their own. So one day me and my dad were having lunch and I just got a new haircut. Imagine Boo from Orange is the New Black. That's how very, very dunky I was at that time. And my dad says, oh, I like your hair. It's very, um, it's very lesbian chic. <laughs> Right. So, so Dad, you, you basically figured that 
kind of into women then? Well, I mean, yeah, you, you did wear a lot of waistcoats when you were 15. <laughs> Which, for starters, rude. But secondly, is a very damaging stereotype, I don't know. <clears throat> Anyways, but no. Love oh, my dad is very supportive, as you can tell by sitting through all of this. So, <laughs> thought I'd reward him by chatting some more embarrassing shit <laughs> about how I'm a terrible, terrible person. Um, basically, I do not have my life together at all. I once cried because my tea was too hot. <laughs> I wasn't even on my period or anything. It was just a long day of sitting on the sofa. <laughs> Another reason why I'm terrible. Um, in Ella's stand-up, that friend who said she was the blackest friend they have, in my defense, Surrey is very, very white, okay? <laughs> um, it's close enough to London that people don't say racist things because they're worried that there might be one behind them, but they're thinking it. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm all woke now. Um, another reason why I'm terrible, I once slept with someone after they said that Hitler had some good points. <laughs> he also made me bring pizza. It was a bad, bad time. <laughs> so, as I'm now coming to the end of my um, segment of humiliation, um, I would like to invite you all, after we've drawn the raffle, well, no, I'm, I've run out of things to say, Michael. <laughs> it's the end, oh, the list doesn't go on. <laughs> I only wrote these many things, unless you'd like me to come up with more terrible things, that's just you meet me at the bar later and then I have material for my next stand-up, <laughs> in which I will humiliate myself further. In the meantime, Michael's going to come back and do some raffly shit, so get your tickets ready and give me a couple of rounds. many, many years ago. No, my confession is um, I hate the notebook. And this is, like a, this is like a really sore subject with a lot of my friends. I really hate it. It's a terrible film with an incredibly terrible message because, okay, for one, I don't think Ryan Gosling's all that. Some people seem to have read their nick and say, oh, I'm sorry, his eyes are too close together. His face is weird. But, however you feel about Ryan Gosling, that film would have a very different ending if Ryan Gosling was not considered attractive. If he was like overweight and sweaty with a comb over, it'd be weird that he'd send you 365 letters in a row. That's creepy. And also, I'm sorry, Rachel McAdams is a dumb bitch. Because I don't care how in love you were when you were 17 for three months. But breaking up with, oh no, sorry, not even breaking up, cheating on your fiance for five years, who's James Marsden, Cyclops from X-Men. <laughs> we found my thing. But cheating on your fiance for five years for your three month boyfriend when you were 17 is just fucked up in the head and cruel and mean and you're a bitch, Rachel McAdams. I don't care. So I don't like the note, but it's one of those films that's considered like super romantic and everyone really loves it. And you know that thing in films and TV shows and books and stuff, when trying to be romantic, people like quote things. They quote poetry and they quote literature. I've never really got that. I don't retain that kind of information. Um, the only quotes that I memorize are things like Mean Girls, Harry Potter, and memes from Drag Race. And I just don't think that's going to get my boyfriend in the mood. He was like, I'm sipping, what? That's not gonna help me get laid. And, and I think partly that's due to like things that we read in school. Obviously we read the kind of like basics, like Romeo and Juliet, but again, do not serenade someone with Romeo and Juliet. It's about two teenagers that kill themselves after three days and six other people die. It's not romantic. It's not romantic. But the other things that we read in school were like incredibly dark. One thing that is better to my mind, a quote that I could like serenade my plan with for her and never would. And I don't know if you're familiar, it's a book called The Bloody Chamber by Angela Carter. 
Yeah, we read that extensively in school. If you don't know it, it's like uh, fairy tales rewritten from a like feminist horror kind of perspective. It's very odd. And there's one quote that is forever burned into my mind because our teachers decided it was appropriate at 16 for us to read this book. And I, I'm going to tell you the quote. Her cunt split like a fig beneath the great globe of her buttocks whilst the man in a mask whipped a nine tails across her back. Yes! See, I can see the horror in all of your faces. Burned into my brain from the age of 16. Ten years and now still in there. Ultimately, like, it's a very good book. It makes a lot of good points about feminism and things like that. But it's not a book that should be read by 16 year olds. And it's not a quote that I will ever be able to use to serenade someone like they do in films. And I feel proud of that. Um, however, with some poetry that might be a little bit more quotable, uh, I'm going to welcome to the stage our headliner for this evening, uh, winner of the Manchester Word Award 2018 and the Huddersfield Literature Festival Poetry Slam 2019. Combining poetry with stand up comedy, please give it up for Brogan. Ladies and gentlemen, are you ready for some comedy poetry? I can't hear you, I said, are you ready for some motherfucking comedy poetry? Are you ready for rhymes? Yeah. Are you ready for free verse? Yeah. Are you ready for the subversion of literary conventions to achieve comic effect? Yeah. I thought you were. <laughs> I say boom, 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 let me hear you say poetry. That was really good. I did, I did that once and everyone said, way ho. Very Pavlovian of them. I won't stand for it. My name is... <laughs> uh, my name is... Brogan, Terebio, Paul, Tysak, Carlin, which you will all have noticed is at once not a name. <laughs> yeah, paradoxically, far too much of a name. <laughs> but it's it's interesting. It's an interesting name. In fact, it's more interesting than than most names. For example, Sir, what's your name? Daniel. <laughs> no, I'm not saying I'm more interesting than Daniel. <laughs> Just saying it's likely. <laughs> no, but it's it is it's an interesting and Daniel's a great name, I can uh, uh, Brogan or Bracorn, Bracorn in the original Irish, uh, means tiny badger. <laughs> which isn't relevant to anything. But it's a nice little a nice little tidbit, it's a little thing about me. Another thing you need to know about me is that I'm a bit of a gangster. Um, I consider myself a bit of a gangster. Um, but. <coughs> sort of shaking the head of the man. <laughs> An unbeliever. A heathen of sorts. <laughs> I'm a gangster. I am. Um, I, I, like, I like gangster rap. Um, I really like gangster rap. But gangster rappers come under fire a lot for the use of derogatory language, don't they? These um, Lil Wayne's, <laughs> Justin Bieber boys, Mila, Mila Kunai. They're, they're always, always dragged in, in the fire and hell. That's all right. We're all up to speed. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they get they get criticised a lot for using uh, misogynistic or racially charged language. Um, but it's not the lexicon of this current generation of gangster, the gangster rapper, that I find most concerning. I'm more concerned by the lexicon of the Italian American gangster of the forties and fifties, and uh, they're even around now. <laughs> I'll get you. 
You've seen them in the films, usually directed by uh, Martin Scorsese or Francis Ford Coppola. Um, <laughs> usually got someone like Alexander Pacino in, or <laughs> Joseph Fishy, one of these boys. <laughs> and there's a phrase that they use a lot in these films that upsets me, not necessarily because it's explicitly offensive, but because I don't understand what it means. Um, <laughs> I don't think it translates well to an English audience. And I thought it was time to rectify that, so I've, I've tried to make sense of it. Um, and I thought that considering we're all friends now, <laughs> we could go through it together and decipher this nonsense phrase once and for all, put it to bed. <laughs> so this is a poem. The first poem of the, of the set. <laughs> it's about that phrase and it's called flirt or you look like a million bucks. <laughs> You're like a million bucks. You're difficult to read. <laughs> You like a million books. You're heavy. <laughs> you like a million books. Incredibly fun to repeatedly hit with a stamp. You like a million books. You're impossible to understand. You like a million books. You'd be on my grasp. You like a million books. Far too much for an evening. <laughs> You're like a million books, beyond the realms of reasonable ambition. You're like a million books. You've got two million hours. <laughs> so level one hours. It's going to be a long half an hour. You're like a million books, you're a logistical nightmare because of all your antlers. You're like a million books, you're male. You're like a million books, I'm a big books now, proper books, reading books, bookie books, the metaphors back on track. You're like a million books more than anyone could ever ask for. You're like a million books more than anyone could ever need. No one needs what you're offering as a whole. Partition party would be useful, but you can't be used compartmentally. You see, the books are glued together. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> One million books glued together. <laughs> you offer nothing to anybody. <laughs> You're a giant paperweight. A giant paper waste of space. You're a leather-bound, hardback, paperback waste of space. You're a piece of shit. <laughs> a gargantuan hunk. A hulking mass of information that is trapped within the constraints of its own shit. I can't access the good stuff. None of us can access the good stuff because it's imprisoned by the rest of you. There's no use to me or anybody else because it's entirely shit. I hate you. <laughs> I hate you. I hate you. I hate you for all that you promise. I hate the potential for good you offer, but not feasibly being able to ever make good on by simply being what you are. Your very nature and existence renders anything that could ever be good about you null and void. You're trapped in your own complexity, and your everything is transformed to nothingness because of the very fact that you exist. You're like a million books. You're quite pretty. <laughs> Thank you, that poem's about me. <laughs> I do like that phrase, I'm a liar, I'm a fibber. I like that phrase. Or rather, I like the antiquity of that phrase. Um, it fills me with a sense of nostalgia and appropriate nostalgia, because we live in an age of nostalgia, uh, don't we? Um, makes me nostalgic being here. I mean, a lot of you guys want to, sh want to go to Sheffield Hallam, don't you? Um, it makes me nostalgic for when I went to university, because it's true what they say is, you leave university with far more than a degree. And that's true because I know I left university with depression. <laughs> and type 2 diabetes. <laughs> but this age of nostalgia, it, it, it's, it's seeped into culture. You don't have to go on Netflix, open up the 
the front page, a lot of the time the banner will be for uh, Stranger Things, which is all about everything 80s, and it's all about the 80s, and the thing about Stranger Things that makes it good is that it's actually set in the 80s, and, um, <laughs> and an important thing that not a lot of people know about the 1980s is that they actually happened during uh, the, the 1980s. And, <laughs> Makes them fantastic. Uh, but it goes beyond uh, cultural influence, this age of nostalgia. It's, we, we're in an age of political nostalgia as well. There's a whole breed of politicians whose success can be exclusively attributed to them reminding people of how fantastic and white things once were. <laughs> Which is sad. <laughs> but I don't want to talk about that kind of nostalgia because I don't want to do it. <laughs> I've got nothing new to add to this conversation. That's why I want to talk about an innocent nostalgia. It's a nostalgia that exists and always has within older generations and it's just a pining and a longing for an era or a way of life that they knew and loved and can never get back. So this is about that innocent, wholesome sense of nostalgia it's called, it's called Memories. When I were a boy... <laughs> these were all fields. <laughs> Pure naked nature, not even crops to yield. No cineplex stood in that plot yonder afar. We just skipped gaily through fields, catching butterflies in jar. <laughs> When I were a boy, <laughs> this was just grass. No roads to travel on with your fancy bus pass. It was nothing but green from here to Timbuktu. No Thai massage parlours and nightclubs for you. <laughs> when I were a boy, this was just daisies. And we'd lie on our backs, shirts dirty, just lazing. There were no buildings here, no none, not at all. Not when I were a lad. Well, I'll be honest, that sounds fucking shit. <laughs> it were. <laughs> Side grinder, thank you. I'm never going to express anything more than a vague interest in anything again in my entire life. Because when I do, I receive a present at Christmas or a birthday relating to that thing <laughs> that I have no interest in. And then have to feign enthusiasm for something I don't give a shit about. Um, I'll give you an example. When I was six years old, I caught the last 20 minutes of Bruce Lee's Enter the Dragon. And my mum came and said, we're watching. I said, I'm watching this film called Enter the Dragon with this man called Bruce Lee. It's pretty good. It's a good, good fight scenes. He's fought Chuck Norris. It's been pretty good. Next week I had six Bruce Lee posters <laughs> framed on my wall. And two are still up. <laughs> I've never seen a Bruce Lee film in its entirety. I've seen about 20 minutes of Enter the Dragon. And he's, he's like an idol, he's a god in my house now. He's got a, he's got a shrine, does Bruce Lee. Happened again. I was in the year 11, year 10, year 11, my friend had OT priority. He said, I'm going to get some tickets for Rihanna. Do you want to come watch Rihanna with me? I can get us tickets, definitely. I said, sure. <laughs> I'll go watch Rihanna. I went to the concert, came back. My mum said, did you enjoy the Rihanna concert? I said, yeah, she's a very, very good showman. I enjoyed it. His production volume was fantastic. It was a really good, really good concert. And that Christmas, I received Rihanna's entire discography. <laughs> and that's not an exaggeration. That every album she, she had released up to that point, I had in a stocking. And, then, and I, had to, I had to pretend I was like a Rihanna super fan, you know, the whole summer mum that she spent 40 quid on albums and both thought shit. And we'd be driving around town, Rihanna would come on the radio 
And she was like, oh, I don't like this one. But I know how much you like it, bro. <laughs> so she leaned on as a treat for me. <laughs> and we drive around Hartley Ball, listening to a song that we both thought was wank. And I go to the, but, oh, <laughs> this is pretty good. And it happened again. Um, I started studying English at, uh, in Durham. And I started getting into like Marxist, like literary critical theory. Um, and that Christmas I woke up and I had the decomposed corpse of a Russian czar on the car. Uh, I didn't have the heart to tell her that. Although this would be a really good gift for a proactive, violent Leninist, as a passive Marxist, I. Um, subscribe to a more Hegelian school of thought when it comes to socio-political <laughs> progression. So this was worthless to me, but I, I'd sit in my bedroom trying to find the lost Princess Anastasia in my spare time just to save face, but fucking nightmare. Um, <laughs> but he's been in the news again, hasn't he, Carl? Um, Matt Hancock, Health Secretary, started having a go at Corbyn for being being a Marxist, but it's kind of impossible to to label someone as a Marxist as an insult because Marx Marx subscribes to a school called uh, dialectics, which means that you just you're constantly changing your mind, you're constantly contradicting yourself, and you can't really say that someone is a Marxist because he said so many different. He was constantly contradicting himself, changing his mind, and because of that, he seems quite prophetic. He says a lot of things that he said have happened. But that's kind of just because he covered a lot of bases, like everything that he said in the German ideology goes against a lot of his early right. I, 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 we've gone quite far into Marx and dialectics now, but um, <laughs> for a stand up set. But I've, I've just got, I've got an example. <laughs> right, so this is uh, from a paper in uh, 1860. Scrap yourselves in that. <laughs> Uh, he said, in 1994, there will be a girl band formed called the Spice Girls. <laughs> he continues, uh, and there'll be a sporty one, and a baby one, and a posh one, and a scary one, and a ginger one. And then I have a film called Spice World. <laughs> but then three years later, he, he revisited the topic. He said, I don't think there will ever be a band called the Spice Girls. <laughs> Especially not in the 1990s. <laughs> it is morally and physically impossible for that to ever occur. <laughs> and it's the one thing I'm certain of. <laughs> and it must have played in his mind because four years later, he wrote this next paper. <laughs> He said, no, okay, there definitely will be a band called the Spice Girls. <laughs> and the posh one will marry that lad who plays for United. <laughs> and that one will be called Victoria Beckham then. <laughs> and the others are going to be called Mel B, Mel C, <laughs> Jerry Halliwell. <laughs> And Emma Schmunson, the stupid fucking cunt. It's Emma Bunsen, he's way off. <laughs> fucking idiot, Emma Schmunson. He just, he goes drivel at the end. He just writes, just writes, I'll tell you what I want. What I really, really want. Now tell me what you want. What you really, really want. The means of production. <laughs> nervous about that bit. <laughs> I think any standard bit we have to establish what dialectic is before <laughs> is risky. Um, thanks for being on board, maybe. <laughs> um, but while we're on the topic of politics, I think it's it's important to address an issue. Um, we've skirted around it every day of our lives, but there's a there's a rift 
in this country is a rift, it's dogmatic. And to be honest, I'm not sure whether I'm supposed to be Team Meghan or Team the Duchess of Cambridge. <laughs> It's just something I struggle with, and uh, we all struggle with, uh, daily. Because Bradley Megan said some mean things on uh, the, the wedding day to, to Kate and the kids and stuff. But like, you know, I'm, like, I'm a fan of Marco. She seems, seems hip, she was all right to me. <laughs> but when, when the Duchess of Cambridge ever do anything wrong? So, I've, um, I've tried to break it down. Um, <laughs> I've just written um, a, like a list of pros and cons. It's kind of, it's not really a poem, it's just kind of, it's just in a book that says it's poems. Um, so I thought maybe we could just Figure out who's the goodie and who's the baddie. Okay. Megan Four. She's American. She's pretty cool. She isn't white like a lot. All of the royals are. She was in suits and suits was fine and she has a lovely smile and wears it most of the time. Megan against. She's extremely racist. She called Prince George a fat asshole. <laughs> She's terrible at archery. She called Princess Charlotte a fat asshole. Her favourite film is Eddie Murphy's Norbit. <laughs> Prince Charles, a fat arsehole. <laughs> She's trying to get a catchphrase going, we think, in the rest of it. Okay, let's do some Kate. Kate, four. Seems charming. Has a tasteful collection of hats. Kate, against. Is a Tory, probably. <laughs> she hasn't said, she hasn't been public about it. Speculate. Kate Four. Her father runs a company that deals mainly in the delivery of party supplies. She's a very useful person to know if you're organising a party. <laughs> Kate Against. Has never been to the UK's premier theme park, Chessington World of Adventures. <laughs> Kate Four. Could probably get you a free ticket to the UK's premier theme park. <laughs> She's got no interest in taking you to the UK's Premier Theme Park. She hasn't seen all the adventures. Let's do some more Megan. Uh, Megan Four. Looks great in mustard and mustard is in. <laughs> Megan against. She was the lady that threw that cat in that bin in 2009. <laughs> and we could never let that slide. And God knows I've tried. <laughs> Kate Four, she never hurt a fly. Kate Against, she has tried. <laughs> and she often pokes people in their sides against the consent, giving them a nasty shock. <laughs> She's in Megan Against. She never calls back. <laughs> Megan against. Never text back. <laughs> Megan against. She acts like it was nothing. <laughs> Megan against. She acts like she never knew me. Megan, Megan Four, she knew me. <laughs> Megan Four, she 
you need my soul. <laughs> Megan Four, she loved me. <laughs> Megan Four. She loved every part of me. <laughs> the last day. That last day was hell. <laughs> But she held me, and she held me, and whispered sweet everythings into my soft English with Irish descent ears. <laughs> It rained, but we didn't care. Thunder shattered, but we didn't care. I don't even remember where we were because time and space and life all collapsed into one until it was just a void of me and her. Megan and I. And as she walked away, I began to sink, but she stopped. She stopped and she turned and said one last thing to me. She said, <laughs> Megan against. She called me a fat arsehole. <laughs>